Praise the Lord. It's good to see everybody today. We've been going through the book of Romans, and I very inefficiently have not been able to get through chapter 9 in two sittings. So I'm going to do a little bit of a recap, and then we'll catch up, and we will be done with chapter 9 today, and we'll move on to chapter 10 of the book of Romans. Hosea reminds us via Romans chapter 9, as he also says in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people and her beloved who was not my beloved. Aren't you glad that the Lord calls you his beloved? Amen. It's an interesting thing to be a man and have a term used by God that you would use for a spouse, that I am the bride of Christ. It feels a little funny, but I'm glad for it. Let's, let's just pray. Father, this morning we pray that you'd help us as we go through some very difficult, heavy theological material that you might expand our minds, but mostly you'd soften our hearts, help us to understand more of who you are, that we might be the people you've called us to be. Thank you for this great day. Lord, help us to use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for coming, guys, despite all the fears of anything that could happen. I'm glad you're here. So this is the book of Romans. We're in chapter nine, which talks about Israel's past, present, and future. So nine is talking about Israel's past. And if Israel's past is such that God called them and made them his special people, and if for some reason they seem to have turned their back on him and he on them, then maybe he'll turn his back on us. You see, that's the whole thing, and that's what Paul's trying to tackle here, and that's not the case. Israel was trying to get God's love by doing a certain thing and by performing, and of course, you don't get God's love by performance. You guys know that, right? You get God's love because God gives it, and he sent his only son to prove it before we did anything. While we were still yet sinners, Christ came and died for us. So there's a difference between being obedient to God because you love him and then being obedient to God because you're trying to win his love or you think you're going to win favor or I'm going to get to go to heaven because I was a good boy. Any of you know what I'm talking about? And that's not how you get to heaven. It's never how you get to heaven. It's every other religion in the face of the planet, but it is not Christianity. You get there because of who you know, not what you do. It's like getting a job in the government. Romans chapter 8, I shouldn't bring up the government. <laughs> Romans chapter 8 gave us some very sweet clauses. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is everyone's a sinner and everyone dies. And the soul that sins must die. And there's an eternity that we suffer, but there is no condemnation. In other words, we won't find ourselves on the wrong side of the gavel. Thank God. In verse 28, and we know that all things, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are the called according to his purpose. And we believe that because God is sovereign and he works all those things, our mistakes, our shortcomings, our inabilities. God uses all of that for our good, believe it or not. And verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Of course not. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. There is nothing, there is no sin that you can do that is so bad that God can't forgive you and that he hasn't already forgiven you by the gift of his son if you're in a relationship with him. Amen? All of these things are true because God is sovereign. He does whatever he wants to do. He's like an 800-pound gorilla in the jungle. Where does he sleep? Anywhere he wants. That's right. So picking up from verse 14, we're going to get a running start. Verse 14, for what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God because he selects and chooses people? Well, certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, so much for human choice, boys and girls, but of God who shows mercy. 
For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. You will say to me then, well, why does he still find fault? How can he hold us accountable? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have the power over the clay, the same lump, to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with such long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of his mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom he has called, not of the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. As he says also in Isaiah, I, uh, Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people and her beloved who was not my beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called the sons of the living God. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of the Sabaoth had left us seed, we would have become like Sodom and would have been like Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles did not pursue righteousness, have attained a righteousness, even the righteousness of faith, but Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained the law of righteousness. Why? Because it did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Well, let's see if we can take this all apart. Remember, we talked about how God said, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. This was spoken of when they rebelled against God, when Moses came down with the Ten Commandments, and he said, Moses, just get out of my way. I'm going to wipe them out. I've had enough. And Moses pleads with him and says, please don't do that. He goes, I'll raise up another nation from you. It's okay. And, and you know, I don't know, being 80 years old, that's, that's a job. <laughs> but Moses had compassion, and he said, if you're going to blot them out, blot me out too. That was his heart for the people, even though they were sinners. And, and even though he broke the Ten Commandments in a way that nobody else did, um, God showed mercy on whom he would show mercy. And the bottom line is this. God doesn't have to show anyone mercy. He has a right to erase us like so many bad chalk, chalk lines on a board. He has absolutely every right to do that. So don't pray for justice. Pray for mercy. Amen? Amen. And we looked at Matthew, the, the landowner who sent people out into his vineyard in the beginning of the day, in the middle of the day, at the very end of the day, and they all got paid the same amount. You know, it doesn't matter where you are in Christ, you will have eternity, not because you've earned it or because you worked all day or because you were a good boy or girl, but because you gave your life to Jesus Christ and you accepted the free gift of his sacrifice on the cross for your sins. Isn't that right? Yes. Amen. We went over this last week. And I think about how God has mercy on whom he has mercy. Jesus walks to the pool of Siloam. He finds a guy who's been there for 38 years who's lame, can't get up. He's laid aside the pool because he thinks if he gets dipped in the pool, when the bubbles come up, he's going to get healed. And Jesus says, you want to get healed? And he goes, it ain't never going to, this is the Jersey version, it ain't never going to happen. There's nobody who's going to help me in because when I try to get over there by myself, somebody else goes in and I'll never get a chance to get. So basically, he's been there for 38 years hoping on something that he has absolutely no hope in. You know, there are people that do that. There are people that think that complaining about their situation actually fixes it. Got really quiet in here. <laughs> it's interesting because there were people all around the pool. And Jesus picked one guy. Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. It's an interesting thing how we have such trouble with that. And yet, 
entirely through the scripture. If you read this, looking for God's sovereign choice, you'll see it all throughout, right? Did he choose Abraham? Yes. Did he choose him because he was a righteous guy? No. He was, a, he was an idolater. He says, I'm going to bless you anyway, simply because he believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. His salvation came by faith, by believing God at his word, just like you and I. So then it's not him who wills or him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. You know, it doesn't matter how good you are or, how, or what stock you come from or whether you can boast that you were on the Mayflower or any kind of weirdness. The bottom line is this. God will have mercy on whom he has mercy. Have you cried out and asked him for it? Because it's there for the asking. He says so. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am meek and humble of heart and you will find rest for your weary souls. Jesus implores the entire world to come to him. If you want God's mercy, you just have to ask for it. If you don't ask for it because you're too proud and you say, it's all right, I'll do it on my own. I'll wait till I'm on my deathbed. You don't know what will happen. I think of the airplane that crashed into one of those uh, bridges and people are on their way to work, whistling a tune, listening to the radio, and suddenly a 747 is, is crashing into them. You don't get a chance to repent. Most people don't get that chance. So it's best to do it today. Because we can't play chess with God, can we? Playing chess with God is trying to figure out, <laughs> how am I going to beat God? Do you know he knows every move that can ever be made and the consequences of it, and you'll never beat him? And yet people think they can. Oh, I got it figured out. I know exactly what I'm going to do. Oh, yeah? Luke talks about the king who's going to go to war, that he takes stock of only having 10,000 men. He's going to go against somebody with 20,000 men. You want to make sure you have the resources. And if not, you want to send a delegation of peace because you don't want to fight somebody with 20,000 men when you have 10,000. We are those who have 10,000 and God is the one who has 20,000. It's a massacre. You can't stand before God ever of your own works and say that you deserve heaven, you deserve eternity. None of us do. Thank God that he sent his son. And it's terrible he had to die for us, but he did. So you'll say to me, and why does he still find fault for who has resisted his will? As we stand before the throne of God and we have to give an account of our lives as to what we did, why will God find any of us guilty if he chooses and picks and predestines and calls and glorifies? And he's the one who does all the work. How is it that he can hold us responsible for our deeds? And make you go, hmm? Make you scratch your beard? The bottom line is this. None of us deserves any of that. And if God shows you mercy, you should be thankful continually, 24-7, that you have heard the good news and that God has shown to open up your eyes and your ears. But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say that who formed it? Say the one who formed it, why have you made me like this? Whether you're an $18 million vase or you're a common toilet at a gas station, you know, you make the same, it's made out of the same clay. And it's the one who creates that who determines which will be the $18 million vase and which will be a toilet. Unless you are the really fancy one in the middle. It's a $2,000 toilet there. They're all made out of the same stuff. And it's God is the one who chooses and he can make a vessel of honor or dishonor but we have something to do about that, don't we? Because either you will stiffen your neck and your heart to the Lord until the day that you die, or you will give, give way and say, Lord, you're my boss. I give up. I'm going to stop being willful. I'm going to stop being fleshly. I'm going to stop living in a worldly fashion. I want you to change my nature and make me new. Amen? Amen. There was a day I did that, and it's made all the difference in my life. I'd be dead by now. What if God, wanting to show his wrath, here's the long, continuous sentence with no punctuation. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of his wrath, prepared or fitted for destruction, and that 
might make known the riches of his glory to the vessels of his mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. And it's a... Uh, what if God wanted to be patient with all of the evil people in the face of this planet because his desire is that none perish and that we all come to the knowledge of the truth? That's God's desire. It's expressly written in the scriptures. So why, why is he letting Biden be president? Why is he letting the, the vote be stolen? Why is, why is this happening? Why is that? Why is Pelosi still in? Why? 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 Because God is enduring with great patience the object of his wrath, those who are fitted, prepared, those who are deserving of an eternity separated from God. He's being patient with them because he doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants everyone to have an opportunity. And yet, he's the one who chooses. And you know what? He always chooses rightly. God's pick is always associated with his foreknowledge. When you figure that out, I'd love to hear that. <laughs> what if everything is done so that we might know him? Do you know that is the purpose of your life is to know him? Above anything else, having children, raising them upright, being a good citizen, there's a million great things that you can put your life to. But the greatest thing that you and I can ever do with our lives is get to know God through Jesus Christ, his son. And everything in your life is designed to do that. Well, why didn't my car start? Or like I say, Lord, your car didn't start. <laughs> it's his car. So that I might know him better. Maybe it's so that I can go and get it fixed and I can witness to the guy who doesn't know Jesus Christ who's going to put a battery in for me. Maybe it's so I run to him and depend upon him because I've gotten a little self-reliant. Maybe, I'll tell you what, what if it was all done so that our lives might be enriched by our relationship with Jesus Christ? Look around. When you're in the middle of something, ask the Lord why. He's got gigantic shoulders and he'll give you an answer if you really want it because he wants to get you, get you to know him better. That's the bottom line. Oh, but I got the covid why? Because I was exposed to somebody. They didn't wear a stinking mask. <laughs> a mask is like trying to keep mosquitoes out of your yard with a chain link fence. <laughs> God is sovereign even in that. And so ask him the question as to why. And you know what? Your relationship with him will grow. Amen? Amen. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> okay. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, now all these things happen to them as examples. He's talking about scripture in the Old Testament, all of the things that happened to the Jews. Now, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. The scripture says that the people in the Old Testament, everything they went through is for you. The Bible is for you. Everything that happened to those people, Abraham going and having to sacrifice his son on a mountain, it happened so that you might know when Jesus comes that God's only son was sacrificed. Everything in the Bible was written so that you might know him. They went through all this stuff for you. That's a lot of trouble. You read the Old Testament? I know about Paul getting his head cut off. I know about... Peter being hung upside down. I know about James getting killed with a sword. I know about all of the martyrs getting shot with arrows, getting dragged behind horses. That All of that happened so that we might learn. And how neglectful we are not to read it. These folks, their entire lives were assembled so that we might have this book, so that we could read it and learn from it, and our lives might be different. You read the story of Samson. Don't chase skirts, boys. <laughs> Doesn't work. So we should read it, shouldn't we? The learning process. God being patient with the vessels of his wrath. God is patient. He's not slow concerning his promises, as some people count slow, but he's patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to the knowledge of truth, the scripture says. I don't know if any of you parents 
were helicopters, if you were hovering, you know, where you're always watching. Do any of you know this term? Do I just read too much on the internet? When a parent is constantly over a child and, 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 and watching every single thing they do, and, and, you know, and especially with home learning, you're, you're always looking over your child. No, 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 no. The answer is B, dear. Put, put B. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Now move on to the next one. What's the next one? Do you know you program your kids for failure when you do that? When you constantly harangue and hold over them and, you know, in the name of keeping them secure because of your own insecurities, you, you hover over them and you kind of, you helicopter over them, which that's highly manipulative. And you ruin your kids and you'll set them up for failure. I've seen it happen. Here, let me help you with this. Okay, you do the rest. Oh, uh, what? It's not my homework. Why am I doing your homework? I'm not going to do your homework. I passed already. I got, a, I got a degree and everything. You do it. And you know, because there's something to be learned going through the process, isn't it? If somebody just gave you all the answers, you'd get all the answers, get a diploma, start your own business, and never be able to hold it down because you didn't learn anything in the process. There are a lot of people who go through college, they get a degree, they don't know anything. You guys ever, like, for a test, you just jam stuff in your brain and you, you vomit it all out and you go, I'm glad that's over. Hey, what was question number one? I have no idea. <laughs> because we don't look to learn to incorporate it into our lives. We just try to get it into our brains so we can put the right answer on the page. That's so much works. Anyway, the learning process, God does not helicopter over us and he allows things to happen. You, because he doesn't want to program this failure in us, this failure response, where as soon as something's tough, you know, I'm headed towards a bar, I'm going to, you know, sp spend $100 on liquor, get drunk, get everybody else drunk, and, you know, wake up the next morning and not remember what happened. That's program failure right there. God doesn't want us to do that. So he causes us to go through stuff, and we have to rub elbows with people that we don't like. Any of you have people that you don't? You could say that. You can say there are people I don't like, and I bet you don't choose to hang out with them every weekend, unless you have to. Well, I just, uh, we, my wife and I just celebrated 37 years of being married. <laughs> to one another. <laughs> and we're still standing. So I have, I have a million jokes. Anyway, <laughs> forgive me. Failure, <laughs> difficulty, hardship, all of this, the Lord is patient. He's patient because he wants us to see him in it, in all of the difficulties. And, you know, some of us, it, the scripture says every heart knows its own sorrow. You, we can't enter into it. We can't enter into the sorrows of someone else. I, I have troubles that you don't know of. You have troubles I don't know of, and I, I can't feel your pain. I, so I don't try to say, I understand, darling, how this is. No, I don't understand how it is, because the scripture says I can't. But what I do know is God has a plan for whatever it is you're going through. Amen. And usually it's to get junk out of my heart. The stuff I go through, the hardship, the difficult people, all of that, it's to get junk out of my heart so I can be more like Jesus. So don't spurn difficult people in your life. God put them there to make you like Jesus. Amen. Got one amen. Okay. <laughs> Verse 25. As he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people and her beloved who was not my beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, that they shall be called the sons of the living God. Do you know if God picked the Jews and the Jews only, no Gentiles would be saved? And yet the scripture says that there are, there's a people that's not my people. There is a beloved, there's, a, there's a, a, a betrothed, if you will, who's not my betrothed, who will be. And he speaks of us as an adoption through Jesus Christ. In 2 Peter 3, 9, says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That is God's desire. He wants, he's in the job of adopting. 
And so if you want to be adopted, all you have to do is cry out, and Scripture says we should. Amen. Adoption is a wonderful thing, and I'm glad for people that have the heart and the finances and the ability to do that. But I'm, I'm glad for God that he's willing to adopt us. That we're not his people. We're not acceptable. There's nothing about us that's uh, appetizing to him that says, ooh, I got to get this guy on my team. I always thought, you know, if Billy Joel would just get saved, my goodness, he could, he could write some songs, make the whole world sing. Oh, no, that's Barry Manilow. Him too. <laughs> and there'll be someone who's called my betrothed who's not my betrothed. He's talking about the bride of Jesus Christ, which is the church, by the way, and that's all of the various pieces of it, uh, not just uh, Grace Bible Fellowship, but the church universal, all those who confess Jesus Christ as their Lord. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, which is what he promised, the remnant, which means only a portion, shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make short work upon the earth. What that means is he's not going to endure forever the junk that's going on on this earth right now. He won't wait forever. There's going to be a point where he draws a line and he says, come home. And those of us who know him will be home. And the Jews, although they, they claim to have this exclusive right through Abraham, the promise was given to Abraham and you become a child of Abraham by faith. Because that's how Abraham became a child of God. Because he believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And his offspring are as the sand of the seashore because it's not just the Jewish people, it's the church. He said he would bring a seed, which is Jesus Christ, who he did. So it's not just the Jews. By the way, this, these folks are from Jews for Jesus. And there are Jews who will come to know Jesus Christ. They will understand that he is the Messiah. There are Jews now that have come to know Jesus Christ. It says here in Micah 7, 18, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. And you know, Every year there are Jews who find Jesus and they find him to be the Mashiach, the Savior, the Messiah, like this guy right here. <laughs> As Isaiah has said before, unless the Lord of the Sabbath had left us a seed, Sabbath means of hosts, of the, of the heavenly host, he's the, he's the general of the army, if you will, had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been made like Gomorrah. Isaiah says, if it wasn't for God leaving a portion of righteous folks, we would have been just like Sodom and Gomorrah. If God hadn't chosen and selected certain people, if he didn't have a plan in place, everybody on the face of the planet should be wiped out. In Romans 3, 23 to 24 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Every single person, every one of us stands before God maligned. We're all born with sin, and that's our nature. Until we come to Jesus Christ and he changes our heart and mind, we have absolutely no hope of attaining. Romans 3, 10 and 12 says, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks God. All have turned aside, together have become worthless. No one does good, no, not even one. That's what the scripture says about all of humankind. And that's why we need a new nature. That's why we need a savior. That's why God has to come into our lives and change our nature or we're just going to be lost. And I said this last week, why do bad things happen to good people? According to the scripture, there are no good people. None are righteous. No, not one. There's, everyone has become unprofitable. The poison of ass is under their tongue. Their feet are fast to, to run into... To, to evil, their hands are full of blood. Uh, the scripture goes on to talk about all of these things, every single one of us. Bad things don't happen to good people because there are no good people. This is philosophy 101. I'm so glad you were able to come today. Can God make a rock so... No, I'm sorry. Psalm 127 verses 1 and 2, a song of a sense of Solomon. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. 
It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, and to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Bottom line is, whatever it is that you're worried about, you have to know that God is in control. You got to get up early, you got to stay up late because you're worried about things happening. He gives the analogy of a watchman on the wall, looking outside the city gates, looking for trouble, looking for an army that's coming so you can shut the gate and get everybody ready. You do it in vain. You stay up nights, you wake up early and you go to bed late. It's all for nothing if God's not in it. Unless the Lord builds the house because none of us is qualified to build something up to snuff or up to code. So what shall we say then about God's sovereign choice? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. And you know why that is? Well, I think it's shocking too. (laughs) That those people who are not good enough, God proclaims good enough because of his son. Because Jesus is good enough. And Jesus performed the law to the nth degree, and he did it for you. And the sacrifice is there for you. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you can know him today. And I'm just so glad that you guys have come to know him. Hebrews 11.6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Just simply put, God wants you to believe him. He doesn't want you to do a bunch of stuff and try to impress him because you can't impress him. It's impossible to please him without faith. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, first of all, that he exists, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The scripture also says, you will, you will find me when you seek me, when you seek me with all your heart. So in view of God's sovereignty, he also says, this is the way in, and you have to choose even though God is the one who makes a sovereign choice. He's the one who opens up our eyes and our mind. He's the one who prepares our hearts. There's two things we can do. We can be trying or we can be trusting. And it says here that the Gentiles now trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross as opposed to trying to be good enough. You know what trying to be good enough is? It's worthless. Good enough for what? Good enough for God to love you? God already loves you. He sent his son to die for you. So you should lay down and die for him. It says in James 2.26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Faith in believing what God says means that there'll be something that happens to you. When you truly believe something, it dictates how you behave. And when you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you believe that God sent him and died for you, that produces a humility. It produces a servitude. It, it, it produces this love for God where you want to do just anything that he wants you to do. That's what happens when you have faith. I notice when my heart gets hard, I don't want to do the hard things like wake up. I got a bruised and battered body, boy. It's hard to get up in the morning. My back hurts. My Everything hurts. I got new things hurting all the time. Can your hair hurt? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> had some hurting hair this morning. But it seems like that when we're far from God. But when, when our relationship is good and our heart is warmed by his love, we naturally do those things which please the Father. And so I never try to work up to a place where God finds me acceptable. I know that I'm free and I know that I'm forgiven for my sins, for my past, my present, and my future sins. And that's why I sound like I'm so incredibly uneducated up here, because I am. And I know that God accepts me, and I don't worry about anybody else, sometimes to a fault because I have to show love towards people anyway. You can do two things with your children when you're raising kids. You can teach them to believe or you can teach them to behave. Most parents teach them to behave. Stop that, sit down. No, no, I don't hear anything from you anymore. You're teaching them to behave. Stop that, come here. 
you're teaching them to behave, right? And you think, wow, I've been a good parent because I've bossed them into a hole. Or you can teach them to believe. And then the Spirit of God comes into them, and then they do those things that naturally please the Father, and you don't have to stand there like some kind of warden. Right? You guys know what I'm talking about? Just, just nod. It's hard to see through the masks, but there you go. Verse 32. Well, I'll back up. Why is it that Israel did not find themselves acceptable before God, but the Gentiles did. It's because of faith. It's because the faith that produces action inside of us and that changes us. Why? Why did the Gentiles acquire something by not working for it that the Jews did not by working for it? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Isn't it interesting? God uses this picturesque language of a stone, and he says, I put a stone in Zion, which is in, in Jerusalem, essentially, in Israel, and it's a stumbling stone. God put a stumbling stone walking along and there's a big rock in the path. Hey, who put this here? God did. Jesus is that stone. It's an amazing thing. You can take rock and stone, you can follow throughout the scriptures and it always refers to Jesus. It's an amazing thing. But anyway, I digress. First Peter chapter 2, verses 7 to 10. Therefore, it to you who believe, he is precious. That's the stone of stumbling, who is Jesus. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. That's what God says of you if you've come into Jesus Christ and you're part of his family. You're a royal priesthood. By the way, you weren't allowed to be a king and a priest, but Jesus was. And so he says, that's what you are. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And he did that in us so that we might serve him. And so don't trip over the stumbling stone. In Luke chapter 20, Jesus says this. Then I looked and said at them, I looked at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken but whoever, whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. And the chief priests and the scribes at that very hour sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the people, for they knew he had spoken this parable against them. Jesus spoke a parable against the, uh, the Pharisees. He talked about a landowner who had given his land to some people to work, and they worked the land, and the land was doing well. And so he sends a messenger to collect some, some mortgage, and he gets beaten and thrown out, and then he sends somebody else, and they get beaten and mocked and thrown out. And then he goes, I'll send my son. Certainly they'll listen to my son. And so he sends the son, and those who were in uh, the, the, the farm says, this is the son. If we kill him, then we can inherit the land. And see, Jesus was talking about himself. He was talking about himself being put to death. And it's funny because they didn't know that. And then he says, the stone of stumbling, you're going to do one of two things. Either you're going to fall upon it and be broken, or it will fall upon you and you will be just completely blown out into powder. We have a choice of what to do with Jesus. Either you fall upon him and you're broken, or he will fall upon you and grind you into powder in the day of judgment. 
It's one or the other. The scripture is very clear. I hope you guys are enjoying the book of Romans. I hope this is enlightening and that you can at least walk away with something here. It's uh, one of the most exciting books for me because it tells in detail, deep theology about who God is and how we are to believe and how we're to behave. And I'm, and I'm glad for that. Mm -hmm.